it's a very it's a great pleasure to be part of the conference unfortunately i cannot be in person because of covid but at least at a video from lawrence new york and hopefully we'll get together soon to be able to share ideas and continue the conversation in the late 19th century orthodox communities in central europe they had originally been completely opposed to distant shabbos judentums even after such rabbi scholars as Israel Hildesheim and David C. Hoffman had adopted it for more traditional purposes, nevertheless began to adopt their own version of this in Shabbos Yudentum, Kohomat Israel. One of the primary proponents of this newly developed Orthodox Wissenschaft, which found followers in Frankfurt and eventually in Eastern Europe, was Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac Halevi, 1847-1914, the author of the Rotrishonim, the most extensive history of the time written from an Orthodox perspective. Both Halevi and his contemporary Hoffman were renowned Talmudic Chachamim, historians and critical scholars. Hoffman grew up studying in Hungarian Yeshivot and Halevi in Eastern European Yeshivot. Though Halevi, except for his time in Yeshiva, was an autodidact, and Hoffman was a PhD from the University of Tübingen, both men's writings combined Wissenschaft style investigation of great Talmudic erudition, while remaining committed to certain traditional positions that many early Wissenschaft student scholars had tried to refute. Although the two men shared many common traits, their attitudes toward historical and critical research, and thus their legacies could hardly have been more different. Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac Halevi was one of the 20th century primary architects of contemporary orthodoxy. Halevi was mostly a self-taught scholar who led an eventful and varied life with many intellectual and political achievements. He wrote Rotary Shonim, the first generations, the most comprehensive history of the 20th century, dominated by an Orthodox viewpoint. He also became one of the founders of Agudat Israel, an international Orthodox Jewish body that aimed and ultimately succeeded at centralizing the leadership of the various Orthodox and traditional communities around the world. Halevi was born into a prominent traditional family in Russia in 1847 and was raised and educated in Yeshivot in Eastern Europe, especially in the famous Yeshiva in Volozhin, where he was later appointed to the administrative role of the Bai. He soon developed a reputation as a prodigy in Talmud and came to be seen as a respected Talmud Chacham. Indeed, the first book Halevi wrote was a collection of novel Ayichidushim in the traditional rabbinical and analytical style entitled Batim Levadim, Holders of the Poles a reference to the carrying of the tabernacle table in the desert. The book engaged in complex issues of chazaka, a lucky concept entailing a factual legal presumption based on previous behavior. But his life took a significant turn when, upon his arrival in Germany around the turn of the 20th century, he decided to pursue a scholarly career at a key point in the history of Jewish scholarship. This was not long after Jewish academics, adherents of the School of Wissenschaft des Judentums, had begun to explore the questions of the origin and formation of the Talmud, foundational text of the Jewish oral tradition. These inquiries raised alarm among Orthodox and traditional Jewish leaders in Central and Eastern Europe. A word on definitions. I used Orthodox to refer to communities in Central Europe, mostly in Germany, that had consciously expressed certain separatist, anti-assimilationist ideologies and had formed institutions to support them by Halevi and Hoffenstein. For communities, mostly in Eastern Europe, in which these developments had not yet occurred, I follow current scholarship in throwing the term tradition. The Talmud was, after all, the basis of al that was followed daily by Orthodox and traditional Jews. And these leaders were concerned, not without some justification, that the Wissenschaftlers aimed to discredit it. There were indeed some Orthodox scholars who also saw an opportunity in Wissenschaft to advance their agenda, and or rebel against the Orthodox establishment. One was Isaac Hirsch Weiss, 1815-1905, a noted Talmudist and the author of the five-volume Dor Dor Bedor Shav, Each Generation Its Own Interpreters. This historiographic work in Hebrew on the rabbis and the writings was first published between 1871 and 1891 and was widely distributed. Six editions appeared by 1911. Weiss's large audience included lay people and many yeshiva students. In fact, he had studied the yeshivot at Trebish and Eisenstadt and had been offered a position as a number of yeshivot near his hometown. Great rabbinical authority at the time endorsed and praised his publications, Tum Doshe Alacha, the Sifra, a Midrash of Leviticus, with his introduction and notes published in 1862, and Menechilta, with his introduction and notes published in 1865. Talmudic scholars were really readers of his works. Once his critical approach was noticed, however, Weiss had to abandon his career as an Orthodox rabbi. 
the earlier approbation of his work by Rabbi Lazar Alivi Horowitz, published in, his first, in the first edition in 1862, was edited in the 1947 edition to exclude Weiss's name. Weiss's engaging style made his book uniquely powerful. He employed a critical approach to rabbinic sources, discussing the developed of Balcha and placing it in historical context, a signature characteristic of Eastern Shabbos Yomitons. Dor Dor Toshav described the history of Talmudic and other rabbinic literature and explored the characters of the primary sages. Although Weiss agreed with the Orthodox claim of Torah Mi Sinai for the written and oral laws, his critical portrayal of the character of the various sages and his claim that the oral law had developed and changed through the ages challenged the reigning traditional view and raised doubt about the value of the oral law in traditionalist circles. Rabbi Chaim Oizer Grudzinski lambasted Dor David Orshav in his approbation of that malicious Dor Isharim, referring to Weiss' work as containing, and that's one on your handout, Libertine criticism focused on weakening the basic foundations of the oral law, and accusing it of having taken root even in places Torah thrives and is dear to her students, bringing in its wake the forgetting of Torah and the abandonment of Judaism. On the other side of the spectrum, Israel Kudosheim was a proponent of this and as an ideal tool to strengthen religion and preserve its practice. He believed that Torah study and scientific research would share the common aim, the pursuit of truth. In 1873, Hillesheimer founded the Rabiner's, the Rabiner's Seminar in Berlin. In 1883, it became known as Das Rabiner's Seminar zu Berlin. He wrote that it would aim, and that's two in your handout, to make science hitherto unable to make peace with traditional beliefs serviceable and fruitful to the knowledge of Torah, and through its methods enrich and advance truly Jewish knowledge. Hildesheimer shares some of the other more liberal scholars' goal of using this in shop to raise the dignity of Jewish practice and scholarship. But unlike his liberal counterparts, he believed that this in shop as Judentums could be made compatible with traditional belief and used to fight religious reform. One of the most prominent scholars and teachers at the Hildesheimer seminar and a member of the original faculty there was Rabbi David C. Hoffman, Halevi's contemporary. Likewise, Hoffman had smicha and engaged in both traditional Jewish learning and academic study of rabbinic law. Hoffman was, however, also criticized within many Orthodox circles for his scholarly work. Though initially most Orthodox and traditionalist leaders, except for those at the Hildesheimer Rabbinic Seminar, opposed this and shut these the Orthodox and traditionalist communities struggled to contain the spread of this and even among those they considered to be faithful. Even the comparatively insular Yeshivot of Eastern Europe could not keep out various products of this shaft. Along with Weiss's work, Gretz's History of the Jews, for example, was translated into Hebrew by Shaul Pinchas Rabinowit and published in installments from 1888 to 1898, reaching a wide audience. Gretz's claim of the middle of the road ideology coped with the fact that he was a former disciple of Rabbi Samson for Hirsch, head of the Orthodox community of Frankfurt, Germany, made him especially threatening. With the publication of these and other popular works, Visser Shabbos Judentums made significant inroads into the traditional community and began to affect yeshiva students in Eastern Europe, making it quite difficult for leading Eastern European rabbis to follow Hirsch's path of condemning the growing field without offering an alternative. The time was right for the development of an orthodox Wissenschaft that could be used to advance and validate orthodox traditionalist ideologies. Halevi thus found himself in the right place at the right time to pioneer this orthodox Wissenschaft and apply it to the Talmud. He arrived in Germany and decided to pursue a scholarly career just as the orthodox needed to address Wissenschaft was growing urgent. Halevi's arrival in Germany inaugurated a new era in the orthodox community and paved the way for a novel reconciliation between the values of the Torah and the Wissenschaft des Judentums. Halevi's orthodox approach to Wissenschaft combined some of the scholarly sensibilities of the Central European form while retaining the perspective of his Eastern European background and with its sometimes apologetic tone aimed primarily at an Eastern European audience. He eventually came to be one of the greatest exponents of this newly developed orthodox Wissenschaft. What were its characteristics? Its scholars sought to respond to Wissenschaft des Judentums by claiming a similar search for objectivity. In writing Jewish history, however, they preferred Jewish sources to the exclusion of most others, and they believed in the continuity of Jewish history from the days of the Bible until their own time. Halevi's writing similarly extolled objectivity in the finest Wissenschaft tradition, but he also much preferred consulting Jewish sources to any alternatives, 
And he often argued that Jewish practice had not changed much between the biblical period and his own time. For example, in contrast to most petitions of Vistich of the Judentums, who worked to show that both ancient rabbinic law and more modern halacha were the products of historical development, Alevi argued that the history of the Talmud lacked dynamism and creativity. Instead, he argued that the Talmud, that the Talmud tradition was mostly a static one in which the earliest texts were definitive and any later interventions by the rabbis were fur, fairly insignificant. Alevi often expressed this opinion in the Shonim, as can be seen in this excerpt, excerpt 3 in your handout. The Jews, however, have no new Torah and no new Judaism. What was from the earliest times is what we see in the latest times, and what is found in scriptures is what, what is found in later homiletics and the behavior of Elkanah. Samuel and David was no different from the behavior of all Israel until the end of the Second Temple period, and is identical for having inherited the tradition and for what we call the Mishnah. In Halevi's view, it was of paramount importance to establish the antiquity and the integrity of tradition because it could validate the Orthodox claim against reform in the broad sense. Not only the reform movement, but also the positive historical schools of Terrence Frankel, the forerunner of American, American conservative Judaism. To support this framework, Halevi argued that the oral law was transmitted without any creative development or human input. To this point, Halevi argued that even rabbinic practices, like prayer and the study of texts, were the same in First Temple times as they were in rabbinic times. He went so far as to claim that synagogue practices, such as repetition of the Amidah prayer, were performed in the First Temple period, and the repetition of prayers by the Chazan dated from the earliest biblical times. Although the Talmud in B. Yonah 28b quotes as Agadah, as he quotes as Agadah a similar concept on the subject of Abraham's observance of later big edicts, Halevi was unique in taking this idea as historical truth. He also saw continuity between this first temple period observance and the al of his own time. Halevi went on to establish himself as a representative of Orthodox Wissenschaft, particularly through the writing and publication of the Orthodox Shonim. At the same time, Halevi also applied his political acumen in order to first envision and then bring to fruition the greatest political achievement of Orthodox at that time, the founding of the Orthodox political body, Agut of Israel. His theory about the formation of the Talmud laid out in the Rotter Shemin massively combined his scholarship, political vision, and apologetic agenda in defense of Orthodox and traditional Judaism. And traditional Judaism. Not every Orthodox or tradition in mind the contemporary Halevi, however, agreed with him that the oral tradition was largely static. Halevi's position was one among several in the Orthodox traditional world in the early 20th century. A much different one was Hoffman's. Hoffman, whose ability to move between the scholarly and Orthodox worlds is representative as reminiscent of Halevi's, accepted the traditional Jewish position that scripture was of divine origin as thus could not be studied using unrestrained scientific scholarship. One of his major scholarly works was an essay attempting to refute the Grefel Ochel's argument for the documentary hypothesis. It should be noted that in this essay he refuted specific arguments of Grefel Ochel's, but did not address the documentary hypothesis directly, perhaps finding it unnecessary or even heretical to acknowledge it as a possibility. But his writings regarding the oral law, the Torah Shabal were of a different character. On, on the one hand, in a few places, he claimed that the oral and written laws at Rashi Bichtah were one, and that both had originated at Sinai. In his actual analysis of the Mishnah, however, he often used, met used methods similar to Frankel's and Gratz, engaged in textual criticism, seeing historical development of the Mishnah test, and putting certain Mishnah terms in the wider context of the learned culture of the ancient Near East. In his doctoral dissertation on the Amorish Mueh, later published as a book, he also discussed the relation between Shmuel's personal characteristics and halachic decisions. What did Hoffman mean by the discrepancy between, on the one hand, the written oral law and the other his theoretical writings about the oral law and his actual study of it? Hoffman describes approach in the introduction to his work on the Mishnah, the Erste Mishnah on the controversy of the Tanaim, the first Mishnah and the controversy of the Tanaim, later translated into Hebrew as Hamishnah Rishon Alfut of the Tanaim, and that's four in handout. Scripture, both in content as own form, constitutes the word of the living God. Its date of composition, in the most instances, is clear and defined, and immediately or shortly thereafter it attained its final immutable form that has been preserved until today. The Mishnah, on the other hand, also has content derived from a divine source to the extent it contains laws transmitted from Sinai, but its form is only fixed at a later time. Consequently, 
when analyzing scripture, we take its authenticity and perfection as axiomatic and only accept conclusions that do not contradict this principle. As for the Mishnah criticism, to the extent it does not contradict Allah established by the sages of the Talmud, historical research concerning the date of its composition, which is based on the period in which its extant form was fixed, is not only permissible, but research into the source of the transmitted Torah is in fact obligatory. In other words, Hakam strongly believed that at least at one point in its development, the Mishnah was a human creation which allowed for scientific investigation into its origins and changes over time, though he also thought that Jews are obligated to follow Allah established in the Talmud. This last point about Allah reminds us that Hoffman was not only an orthodox scholar, but also a Posek, a rabbinic legal decisor, the author of the widely respected responsive collection, Melamed Lehoyel. Since high-level the academic debate is by definition confined to relatively small circles, it is reasonable to assume that most of those people who wrote Shailot, the Allahic questions to Hoffman, and read his responses to Shavuot did not know his academic work. But the academic realm at least partially intruded into Hoffman's legal, Jewish legal decisions. To many Orthodox leaders, most prominently by Hirsch of Frankfurt, the idea of the historical development of the oral law was heresy. Though more recent scholarship has concluded that Hoffman's Orthodox beliefs were more important for him than his academic methods, Though he excelled at the latter as well, attempts were made to punish Hoffman. In response to the academic writings, some Orthodox and traditional rabbis actually sought to invalidate his Jewish legal decisions because of his views on the oral law. For example, by revoking the Askamot for his books of response. Halev is among those who attacked Hildesheimer's seminar, saying that the faculty member, presumably including Hoffman, saw it as unimportant for the rights for or against the Torah. Despite Halevi's criticism of the seminar, which also included a remark that its faculty spent so much time on this and that they could not have had sufficient opportunity to study Torah, he could not apply his rigid model of halachic transmission to every situation. Halevi had to formulate a more nuanced explanation regarding the development of rabbinic Midrash Halacha, which derived Halacha from biblical sources. One example of such rabbinic exegesis is the Midrash addressing the repetition of the verse, you shall not boil kid in its mother's milk, three times in the Torah. The Midrash explained that the apparently superfluous second and third verses were meant to add the prohibition of consuming and deriving any benefit from a kid cooked in its mother's milk to the initial prohibition of cooking a kid in it. Halevi conceded that Midrashic exegesis was a later development and that its purpose was to provide scriptural proof for laws received at Sinai, but not to derive new laws. This more nuanced view was still at odds with those of medieval rabbinic authorities, such as Maimonides, who clearly believed that there was a creative midrashic process. According to Maimonides, the rabbis derived a substantial portion, and possibly the majority of the law, by creatively employing exegetical devices, such as the 13 midot, exegetical rules of Rabbi Ishmael. In claiming that the law should thus be defined as rabbinic and not from Sinai, Maimonides departed from the earlier rabbinic conception of a static halacha, termed the retrieval model by Moshe Haftal, which depicts the entire body of oral law as having been received by Moses and transmitted through a continuous chain of scholars. Maimonides was the first to claim that the rabbis introduced novel interpretations to the Torah and made creatively derived contributions to the halachic process. As Halbertar explains, and that's five on your handout, he views the halakhic process cumulative, each generation adding substantive norms derived by their own reasoning to the given revealed body of knowledge. Halevi, in his relentless attempt to create the illusion of rabbinic consensus that aligned his view of an unchangeable tradition, forcefully reinterpreted even Maimonides' view as agreeing with the statement of Nachmanides, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman the Ramban, 1194-1270, that all Jewish law is biblical and transmitted from Sinai. In Halevi's Verkoshang, there was no room for a perspective that allowed for innovation. In his view, the rabbis never created law. Their law was limited to transmitting traditions taught at Sinai and applying exegesis to find allusions to traditions, to the tradition in verses of scripture. This position is essentially the opposite of Hoffman's on the same point as just described. Given Halevi's insistence on the equity and the mutability of the oral law, it is striking that in Dorot Rishonim, Halevi sometimes criticized traditional rabbinic sources when he thought that they had reached mistaken conclusions. 
He justified this criticism by explaining that since the sage's priority was searching for Allah and truth, they may have occasionally erred in matter of historical accuracy. While Halevi often softened his criticism with wording such as his meaning is obscure, with all due respect, he did not always proceed so gently. Regarding the high medieval Tosafot, who often used creative dialectical arguments to explain apparently contradictory early rabbinic opinions, Halevi said that they explained nothing and made up new homilies which have no basis. Halevi feared that any legitimization of creativity would lead to anarchy and reform and would threaten the basic foundations of orthodoxy. Given that Halevi's historiographical method would itself constitute a great innovation, this fear seems somewhat paradoxical. As Halevi himself noted numerous times, early rabbinic authorities did not have a historical consciousness. Thus, they often presented anachronistic accounts. Rabbi Avram Yitzchak, a coin cook, Halevi's friend and regular correspondent, Seifer noted that at six with the handout, he remarked that we need to be extremely careful about applying new approaches. But I can say confidently that you yourself would agree that you have done more for the state of Judaism with your historical writings, which adopt new approaches in comparison to those of other Torah scholars, than a number of other writers who have given us yet more Hidushim and Pirpolim using old approaches. In his response, Rav Kook Halevi argued that his approach did not offer a radical change, but was merely a reinterpretation of the existing sources, and that's seven in your handout. I have not taken new approaches in my words, but rather God has helped me to find the keys to understanding the Mishnah and the Gemara. I am confident that were the Tosafot Yom Tov, Rabbi Yom Tov Lippen Heller, 1578-1654, a blessed memory of life today, he would quote me frequently in his work. Furthermore, were Rashi and Rambam to see my work, they would be very pleased with all of it. As Sir Cook astutely noted, Halevi understood the power of his historical method, yet when describing the process of the formation of the Talmud and the development of Allah, Halevi presented the rabbinic tradition as unchanged and did not grant any latitude for the creative power of interpretation. Given his paradoxical attitude towards critical historical research, it is notable that Halevi, in his correspondence with Rav Kook in 1908, remarked that it was imperative rabbinical training include external knowledge, idiot chitzoniot, i.e. history and the research of this and Shabbos Yudimtums. Halevi thought that any additional Jewish spiritual renaissance could only be achieved through the study of Jewish history, which would validate the claims of Orthodox tradition and belief. Halevi thus aimed to include his Dorot Rishonim in the curriculum of the Yeshivot as a tool to strengthen the faith of the students and to provide them with the necessary tools to defend Orthodoxy against the heretical claims of reform. He noted his, his satisfaction that Dorot Rishonim had been included in the curriculum of the Lida Yeshiva by Rabbi Yitzchak Yaakov Reines, 1839-1915. He described his goals to his friend and confidant, Rabbi Hyman Kopek. I'm full satisfaction, for if my book will begin to be learned in the Yeshiva, this will fulfill my primary goal, and God will give me the privilege of having contributed to the repair of the paths of Torah in Israel. The contradiction in Halevi's work and now resulting inability to characterize it merely as apologetics demonstrate the difficulties Halevi faced as an historian of the oral tradition in the late 19th century and early 20th century who also considered himself an, an extremely dedicated advocate for orthodoxy. He could not abide the idea of innovation in al so at times his writing seemed to at least imply that it had happened but he also lionized objectivity and analysis of mostly Jewish primary sources, who sometimes led him to criticize accepted rabbinic authorities for arriving at conclusions he deemed incorrect. This may sound similar in some ways to Hoffman's traversing of worlds as a prosaic and academic, who allowed himself to go only so far, though certainly further than Halevi in his critical assessment of rabbinic text. One might wonder, since the two men were contemporaries, what did they think of each other? We actually have some evidence of that. Hoffman praised Dorot Shonim in a review of the first volumes, published in 1901, saying the author was careful and responsible in his conclusions. We fully believe his statement that he did not intend to write apologetics, but rather to pursue the truth through thorough, in-depth studies. 
Ironically, Hoffman's appreciation of Dorot and Shirley was precisely due to the potential impact that it could have on the traditional learning of Yeshivot. For in his view, unlike Halevi's approach, the learning of history had an important role in Talmud Torah. As he noted in his review to Dorot and Shonim, and that's eight in your handout, we see an even more important aspect that this book will demonstrate also the, to the greatest Torah scholar that in order to properly understand the Talmud, both the Bavli and the Yerushalmi, there is a need to have historical knowledge and conduct historical research. We hope that Talmudic scholars will appreciate that and will engage in historical and critical research. At the same time, Halevi wrote to Rav Kook in 1908, criticizing the rabbinical seminaries of the West, clearly referring to rabbinical seminars to Berlin. As he wrote, and that's nine on your handout, however, in teaching yeshiva students the research needed nowadays, there is no need to change yeshivot into seminaries, but quite the opposite, i.e. to strengthen the approach of the yeshivot as needed to teach students only the true analytical methods that were instilled by the Gra, the Gaon to the Evan, the Bishle Lemelech, and the Prechadash and similar authorities, and to teach them a way how to conduct this new research from the Gemara and the Mishnah itself with proper analysis. In Halevi's view, historic and critical research was a necessary intermediate learning, as not to be part of the Shiva curriculum. It was only valid as a tool to strengthen Orthodox beliefs and faiths against the pressures of reform. This approach was consistent with Halevi's view of aesthetic halacha. Why conduct historical or critical research if halacha did not develop over time? It is notable, however, that though Halevi had a totally different approach from Hoffman's, to these questions, he did not criticize Hoffman name. He feared that an obvious polemic between two Orthodox scholars would bring aid and comfort to the secular Wissenschaftlers, writing in a letter, and the end result of this will be that hate will emerge and our enemies will see and rejoice, and I do not want this in any way. Yet Hoffman viewed Wissenschaftlers using tools role quite, the role quite differently. In his view, historical and critical research provided an indispensable additional tool in the quiver of Talmudic scholars. Thus, he criticized Halevi's position on the history of the oral law in an article that he wrote for a German academic journal, saying that he hoped that the honored author of Dr. Shonim would investigate and change his mind somewhat in the coming volumes of the, of the work. Without protecting Halevi's character or adherence to orthodoxy, Hoffman wanted to correct his historical conclusions. It is thus not surprising that Hoffman's critical research, like Halevi's, would be part and parcel of his halachic works. He remarked in that ten in the handout in his introduction to Responsa Collection Melamed Lehoil, few are those who are able to move forward and develop suyot in light of halacha after being entangled in the thicket by the horns of critical research. And I therefore said to myself, grab one approach while not releasing your hand from the other. I did not prevent myself from going down to the ships of Tarshish that traversed the sea of criticism, while not abandoning the approach of my holy rabbis, and I thus offered Hidushim in the map of Liverpool, and in many instances I was successful in combining a few words of criticism with my pure Pauline. And I said to myself, let me write all of these things in a notebook for posterity, critical ideas, halachic response, and my creative people all together. And I call this notebook Melamed Lehoyil because it's my great hope to be helpful, Lehoyil, with this, to my sons and students, to accustom them all to manners of study, sometimes this one and sometimes that one, according to the needs of the time and the subject. Indeed, Melamed Lehoyil integrates all of these ideas. One notable example is Response in 61, in which Hoffman first explains the Bishnai Maser Sheni 3.13, and then goes on to critically analyze the concept of Hasor in Mechsar Agachik Tani, the amendation of the Vishnai text, uh, the, the Vishnai text, commonly mentioned in the Talmud, and then further digresses into his historical research on developing the Mishnah as presented in the Mishnah Rishonah of Huda de Tanaim. In the end, Halevi's attitude on the relationship between al and critical scholarship prevailed. His more traditional views about the immutability of halacha were more widely accepted than Hoffman's newer approach. And the same was true regarding Halevi's opinion of the critical approach to scholarship. After the Second World War, when the Orthodox communities and the Yeshivot were re-established in Israel and the United States, the traditional analytic approach of the Yeshivot remained. 
the critical and historical methods were excluded, not integrated. Notably, even the edition of Rabbi Hill Yaakov Weinberg's 1884-1966 Mechkarim Talmud, published by Musad Rav Kook as volume 4 of his response in 2003, which contains his critical research, omitted his original introduction. In that introduction, he had challenged the traditional view that Ravina and Ravash were the final redepths of the Talmud and criticized Halevi's research as too narrow. Any challenges to the traditional approach were not accepted. The critical historical methods were instead the domain of Jewish studies departments in the universities in Israel and abroad. As David Flato bemoaned, even the Beit Midrash at Yeshiva University, where I teach, focused almost entirely on the traditional methods of learning, incorporating very little of the historical and critical approaches sponsored by Hoffman. This might be changing, however, several Shivot in Israel, such as Shivat Malik Gilboa, are starting to incorporate those methods in the Beit Midrash. My academic Talmud class at Yeshiva College also represents the beginning of introducing these methods as tools in studying the Talmud at Yeshiva University as Hoffman might have wished. We can only hope that this 100th yard site represents the clear beginning of a new renaissance in Talmudic learning.